welcome to our webinar, Artificial Intelligence, the Future of Work. I'm Mackenzie Lockett, and I serve AKSI as the Associate Director of Education. So I'll be moderating the webcast today. Before we dive into the content, just a few housekeeping details. Um, you are often started with your presentation with yourselves muted and with your video turned off, but if you'd like to, you can um, turn, your, turn your video on, but we're going to ask that you keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. We do have the chat feature available for you to interact with other attendees and the presenter during the presentation. When posting, it's gonna show your name, but consider also mentioning your chapter or your university if you would like to do that as well. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A, which you can submit your questions via the chat, or at that point, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question verbally, you may do so at that point. So for our program today, we have Kevin Pereira, who's gonna talk about artificial intelligence. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Kevin. Perfect, thank you. All right. So today I'm going to really be talking um, about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a very kind of pertinent topic. A lot of folks are thinking about it today. Uh, and I'm going to be talk specifically about its effect on the future of work, because I think that's really relevant for um, you know, students and folks who are thinking about entering the workforce. Uh, so I think it's an interesting topic, and that's really what I wanted to, uh, to do today. Um, a little bit about myself at the beginning. So I was born and raised in Hong Kong, spent uh, yeah, kind of entire childhood and everything here. Uh, then went to undergrad in the U.S., uh, was lucky enough to get into uh, Wharton Penn, and was also lucky enough to pledge uh, AKSI over there, so Epsilon Road Chapter, a little bit of a shout-out. Uh, eventually, I ended up going back to a uh, city in New York, uh, working in private banking for a while. Uh, and private banking is a really interesting um, uh, career path, uh, but I think at a certain point, I just felt making rich people richer was making my soul darker and darker. So I decided to then uh, go back to business school. Uh, and after going back to business school at a school called INSEAD, which has a campus in France and a campus in Singapore, I ended up going to work at a startup in Myanmar that was actually doing internet infrastructure. We we're building fiber optic in the ground, cell towers, data centers, that type of stuff. So that's really kind of um, my first uh, step into tech. And after that, I ended up joining a company called Blue Artificial Intelligence. So what Blue does is that they are a strategy consulting firm that specializes in AI. And when we first started it, uh, you know, we thought there was all this talk about AI, but many folks kind of weren't coming to us, and we were a little confused by that. Uh, so after asking around, many people said that when they uh, thought about AI, they either felt fear or confusion. And those were their kind of two overwhelming um, uh, emotions. And I think the way you address that is actually through education. So we started doing a lot of work on the education side and that part of our business really took off. So talks like these, um, you know, I also uh, lecture as a guest lecturer at the Hong Kong uh, University as well as the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So I teach classes on AI for their MBAs there. So not really the coding stuff. Because I think when you show business uh, students coding, they tend to get very scared. But I think if you show them the business applications of AI, they tend to be a lot more interested in the subject. So that's a little bit about my background. So what is AI, right? That's what we're here to talk about today. So if you kind of look at um, definitions of AI that we often see, many of them have some version of simulation of intelligent human behavior, right? And I think the challenge, and, and many people in the industry feel the same way, it's really hard to define AI. Uh, many of them, you know, have an issue with that because intelligent human behavior to you and intelligent human to behavior to me can be very different, right? So for the purposes of our chat today, I want you to think about AI simply as a tool to achieve an objective. And I think if you think about it that way, the emphasis then becomes on the objective, right? What is the business use case? What is the business objective that's there? And I think that's the important. Because when we've done uh, work with companies, many a times they've gone out, bought really good AI technology, and then forced it into a use case. That's a horrible idea. You always want to think about what is my business problem, and then based on that, you want to pick the right AI to address it. Right? It's very important to think about it in those terms. Now, in terms of AI, why now, right? It's only recently, and I'd say the last sort of five-ish years, where it's become really important. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, if anything, I would say that AI is kind of built on three sort of pillars, um, computing, storage, and data transport. And I think what's been really good about AI is that actually the costs have exponentially gone down and the capability has exponentially gone up, all right? And let me give you a few examples of that. So we think about computing power, right? Your, your cell phone that you have in your hand right now has the equivalent amount of computing power that NASA had for the first moon mission. 
And that's only, what, 69, right? So it's probably like 40, 50 years. I mean, for, for things to go from those massive rooms of computers into a cell phone, to me, is absolutely unbelievable. Right? And I think computing power has gotten much smaller and has gotten much more efficient as well. And then, um, you know, perhaps for some of you who were you know, around uh, a while back, and I don't want to date myself here, but we used to connect to the internet using phone lines, right? Copper wire. And, uh, you know, if you look at and I, this, this screenshot's a little hard to see, but, you know, we were looking at uh, transfer speeds of 4.61 k kilobytes a second. Right. And when you used to dial into these modems, you'd get these little sounds, right? Like phone lines that like, Ooh, and so uh, it literally connected through the phone line. Now the challenge with this is, you know, you're at your 4.61 kilobytes a second, your 180 megabyte file would take 39 years to download. Okay. Uh, today on a typical 4G network, 180 megabytes files probably less than a minute. Right. So again, just goes to show the exponential change in what we're seeing on the AI side. And if we think about the sort of progress, right, I think it's important to look at human progression versus AI progression. So if you think about kind of, you know, at least the theory of evolution with chimps become human beings, right, or homo sapiens, this thing has taken four million years, right? If we look at kind of that evolution in terms of robotics, you know, this little guy over here, the leftmost robot, he could probably only walk a limited distance, needed to be plugged in. If he fell over, you know, he would completely not be able to get up, right? But in basically 30 years, we've gone from someone or something, I should say like that, to Asimo, right? And if you haven't had a chance, I definitely encourage you to Google Asimo, but he's a robot developed by the company Honda in Japan. And so, you know, it's very interesting, right? Because if you look at really the progression, I think the fact that we've got from here to there in 30 years is amazing. But I think the more interesting part is, in 30 years, where are we going to be, right? And so Asimo can, at this point, play soccer with you. He can mix a drink. He can, you know, shake your hand. Uh, so I think the really interesting thing is what's going to happen in 30 years, okay? So I think that the sort of the history piece of AI is, is, is quite, uh, quite a cool thing to look at. And I also think that future evolution of AI is really exciting as well, right? So I think the important part then becomes what does that mean for us, right, in the future of work? And I think when you're thinking about AI in the context of that, it's important to think about what is AI good at and what is human beings good at. And in a general case, AI tends to be good at very repetitive and structured tasks and tasks that require a lot of processing, right? Human beings tend to be better at wider tasks. So for example, if you think about that, the processing example, right? Let's say we had pictures of animals. If we gave the AI uh, the, all the pictures and we asked it, is this a cat or not a cat? that's actually very easy for an AI to answer. But if you ask the AI, what animal is this? That's actually very hard because it needs to learn what each individual animal is, right? And that's tough for an AI. Whereas for human beings, we've seen dolphins, we've seen tigers, we have experience at all this stuff. And so therefore, it's actually a lot easier for us to do those wider tasks, okay? So when we typically look at um, cases with our clients, you know, uh, I think most of the solutions that are, how do you say, um, uh, you know, tip like cost effective would be the ones where you combine the human being and the AI, right? And it's, and it's, and it's twofold. The, on one side, it's capability. So like what I talked about before, the other side, it's also trust, right? So let's take, for example, you know, uh, I mean, or, or something you guys can think about. So would you get on an airplane with no human pilot, right? And I think many people would tell you, I want a human being there in case something goes wrong. But the truth of the matter is today, if you fly in an airplane, um, normally the, air, the, the pilot will take off. You'll hit a big red button called autopilot. It'll take you all the way to the end, and then it will land, right? And so the AI is doing most of the flying, and, but people still prefer a human being there. And I think when they prefer a human being there, they won't even ask, right? Um, did the pilot have a couple of glasses of wine before he started? Did he have a fight with his partner before? Right? I think there's a lot of um, implicit trust that goes with human beings. So I think with any solution, you need the capability and you need the trust. Right? If, you don't, if you only have one, it's hard. And uh, if, if you have both, then I think people will start thinking about uh, adopting that type of AI. So again, just some interesting caveats on human beings and AI working together. Now, I think within the context of digital transformation, right, um, you often need a catalyst. And so I think the interesting part is we're seeing a lot of companies uh, looking at the current situation with COVID-19 and realizing that they need to change something, 
right? And I think those folks that, that aren't thinking about that, uh, you know, are, are probably going to be left a little bit behind. Now, I'm sure many of you out there are probably um, in some way, shape, or form, you know, given that AK size is a business fraternity, perhaps uh, interested in finance, right? And so I think one of the metrics that you may want to think in your career journey and your kind of career decisions is not only, you know, do I like it, do I not like it, but I want, I think it's important to think about, is this job that I'm doing less likely to be automated or more likely to be automated in the future, okay? And so what's happening in this chart is the right side is the more likely to be automated and the left side is the less likely to be automated, okay? And also on the y-axis, we have how much uh, those jobs pay, right? So ideally, you wanna be paid a lot, so you wanna be at the top, and then you wanna be less likely to be automated, which is on the left, right? So ideally, the top left quadrant is kind of the cool spot to be. And we'll notice that you, know, you have physicians and surgeons, lawyers, financial managers, right? A lot of folks that are there, but I think it's interesting to see what's in the bad corner, right? Which is really the bottom right. And you'll notice, you know, waiters, cashiers, retail sales, a lot of these ones are what I would call, you know, jobs that are potentially in danger from being automated. And I think this is where a lot of, um, unfortunately, where a lot of people are, right? So I think a lot of governments are thinking about taking people from this right-hand side of the graph and moving them towards the left. And not necessarily towards the top, you know, because that's hard to do, but at least you want to move them towards the left side. So you've got teachers, childcare workers, you know, like social and human services. And, and in my view, these are extremely noble jobs, right? Especially I think in today's context, these are gonna be really, really important. And so I think the question for a lot of us is, you know, how do we make that jump? Like how do we move in that direction? And if we're thinking about it just specifically from an AI context, right? I think a lot of AI jobs today are, are, are thought of as like researchers, software developers, et cetera, et cetera. And we do need those folks. There's absolutely no question. But I think the interesting piece that happens after that, right, is that folks who are business leaders, change management experts, you know, folks who concentrate on the business side, right, they're actually also needed in this whole AI switch as well. So even if you're sitting there kind of as a business student and you're thinking, never done programming, I don't really know what that's about, um, I still think there's a big space for you, right? Because I know a lot of programmers and, and folks who are on that side of the world. And trust me when I say that if you ask them to do a presentation or, you know, go uh, make a sale to a client, they're really, really bad at that. And it's just that they don't have the skill set, right? So I think it's important to kind of consider that. And I think if we look at, you know, different companies and who are at different stages of their AI journey, I think folks, when they're at the beginning, right, so when they're doing like five or less kind of AI projects, you tend to see their emphasis being on folks who are, you know, more on that research side. But I think as we get more developed on the AI side, you're seeing that business leaders like UX folks or change management experts, they become more important later on. Build the technology is fine, but you've ultimately got to implement, right? And I think that's when business folks actually matter more. So if you're a business person and you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm really worried about what's coming with AI because there's no room for me, I think you should change the mentality because there, there for sure definitely is. And they often call these um, folks business translators, right? And the idea is you sit between kind of the decision makers and the folks who are developing the AI. So it's a, it's a good spot to be in because I think you can kind of uh, bridge that gap that we're, that we're definitely often seeing. So the big question then becomes, how do you bridge the gap? Right? And in my view, it's really not gonna be about um, uh, uh, how long you were at a job before. It's gonna become more about uh, what skill sets that you gain at that job, right? And, and like I was saying before, I think it's gonna be a question of combining the human and the AI together. So augmenting the human rather than full substitution, right? And, and maybe in the medium and long term, we might see more substitution, but at least for now, it's gonna be much more about augmentation. Right? And I think the only real area you see like real, real potential for substitution is actually on the autonomous vehicle side. So uh, situations where you have a uh, car, right? And you're completely removing the driver and then you have the AI who's driving the car around. But it's very rare though that you see that, right? The pilot example is one. And, and just in general, think about it. Wherever we've been replacing uh, people with AI, you can't 100% get rid of the, the, the people, right? You still need them to work with the AI together. So if we think about that AI and human model working together, 
the question then becomes what skill sets can the human have that the AI finds it very difficult to develop, right? And I think those are things that we need to think about from a, create, from a, a career slash personal development standpoint. So some of those things, at least in my view, are things like building relationships and trust, right? Things like sales skills. So when I was in finance, I was working in private banking. Private banking is a very relationship and trust-based um, environment, right? Whereas if you're a trader, that's a lot more kind of, you know, algorithmic that could potentially be replaced with AI. So I think it's an important caveat to think about the job you're looking at and what skill sets it requires, right? I mean, things like empathy, creativity, right? Uh, critical thinking. I think these are also things that are very hard to simulate with an AI. And I think storytelling is one that perhaps gets a little bit less um, airtime, but I think is very important, right? And here's why. I think whether you're selling something to someone, whether you're making a, a talk or a speech, uh, whether you're even just talking to your coworker about an idea, right? In effect, what you're doing is you're telling a story. And when you're able to tell a story, right, and a good story, two things happen in the brain. One, if you're able to create empathy with your audience, uh, the brain releases a chemical called oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, right? And this actually makes people feel more relatable or related to the speaker. And the second one is if you can tell us a story that keeps people on edge, uh, you actually release cortisol in the brain, which is called the stress hormone. Right? And so if you combine cortisol, which makes you kind of active and, and, and ready to kind of you know, go, and you also create oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, people are about 20 times more likely to remember the information that you're talking about. Right? So it has a lot of effect there. So being able to tell a story is really, really important. So that's, you know, if you're kind of looking at a skill to develop you know, during this time when you're at home, uh, you know, I think storytelling is one potential good one to really think about. And then I think lastly, don't underestimate human common sense. There's a bunch of times where I've seen kind of AI, um, you know, try to uh, try to uh, spit out an output, which makes no sense. But because people believe so much in AI, they're like, yeah, we'll just do it. Right? It's very, very dangerous to do that. So just keep in mind that you've got common sense and, and that's really, really valuable as well. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I would hate for, for you guys, you know, five years down the line to come back and say, you know, Kevin said all these skills are hard to automate. It's never going to happen, right? So I just want to challenge empathy and creativity with you a, lo in a little bit. So this is actually an area of AI called emotive analytics. It basically looks at analysis of emotion, right? So this is actually a, a screenshot from the time when Mark Zuckerberg was um, uh, at, the, uh, at the Senate and he was being questioned by them, right? So uh, the question that he was given at this point was, you know, how does Facebook make money, right? And so he responds by, Senator, we run ads, okay? And this is cut as soon as he makes that response. So you'll notice that actually with a 99% kind of confidence, the AI thinks Zuckerberg is irritated, right? And, you know, he's probably sitting there thinking the senator who's making like tech policy doesn't understand how Facebook makes money. That's ridiculous, right? But if we look at what the senator is feeling, 92% is joy, right? That's interesting. So maybe the senator is not really questioning for getting information. Maybe he just enjoys putting Mark Zuckerberg on the hot seat, right? And just poking him. So again, uh, you know, I think the interesting part about empathy is that it's about understanding how someone feels and then doing something about it. I think that doing something about it is still a human thing, but at least understanding how, something, how someone feels, that's potentially something where AI can actually be used. Okay? So yeah, just wanna give you some insights into you know, potentially some of these skills, AI making an effort to, uh, to, to look at. Second one uh, is creativity, right? And so what's going on here is that there was a, uh, a conference in Barcelona, tech conference, and there's a very famous artist, sculptor, you know, kind of call him what you want, uh, called Gaudi in Barcelona. He developed a lot of the nice churches, you know, very famous guy. So what they did is they took all the works of Gaudi, put it into a machine, and they, say, and they said, come up with something inspired by Gaudi, okay? So this is what it came up with. And um, from an art historian perspective, you know, I'll let the folks who, who know this stuff better decide whether this is Gaudi-like or not. But the interesting part is when they opened up the AI in the black box, they actually found that there was actually a lot of mathematical relationships here. You know, and so the question then becomes, you know, creativity, right? What is it? Is it based on our experience? And if it's our experience, then could we simulate that experience into a computer and then potentially have uh, something come out, right? I mean, we've had a few companies come to us and ask us, 
can we resurrect artists or, or kind of composers from the dead, right? Because composers, effectively, it's a pattern of sounds, right, music. And so if you have enough patterns that you put into a computer, can it eventually find the commonalities and then come up with, you know, Beethoven's 1071st symphony? In theory, it's actually possible. And so I think that's where potentially creativity could also be seen as something that AI might do in the future. Now, lastly, from a creativity standpoint, um, this I think was another interesting one. So this was the first AI, fully kind of AI painting uh, that an AI fully created itself. And the data set it used was kind of 15,000 similar paintings from, a, from the 14th and 20th century, so between that. Uh, to me, this looks like a guy, right? I mean, I, I don't know kind of the art history part of it, but I think the interesting part is when they sold it at auction at Christie's in, in October of 2018, they initially thought it was going to go for between seven and 10,000 US dollars. It ended up going for 432,500, okay? So again, art is a very hard thing to value, but I think what's being, what's being shown here is that AI being creative can also have monetary results as well, right? So again, I think it's just something for you to think about uh, from a creativity perspective, because I, I do think AI will ultimately have some effect on this, and we might see you know, AI paintings in the future. So I, I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting area to, to potentially. Okay, uh, Mackenzie, I think I'm at my 20 minutes. I have one smaller section to go. Uh, would you like me to cover that, or, or do you want to open it up for questions? What would you like to do? Feel free to keep going. Okay, sounds good, I'll do that, thanks. All right. So the other part that I also want to talk about is one, you know, kind of exciting part uh, that I think is going to drive AI. So we talked initially about those three pillars, right? Uh, computing, storage, and data transport. I think what's really going to change is that data transport part. And the data transport part is going to change because of something called IoT, right? So IoT stands for Internet of Things. And what that really is describing is basically a future where all our devices are connected together. Right? So your fridge will be connected. It'll tell you on your way back from the supermarket, are you running out of eggs? Go buy some eggs, right? Or better yet, it'll be connected directly to Amazon. And when it notices you're running out of eggs, it'll order eggs for you, right? So those are the types of innovations that are actually coming. And it's coming because of something called IoT, okay? Now, this is a sort of fictional picture, but the thought behind IoT is you can access everything from everywhere, right? So more connectedness. And how does this actually happen? So when you think about your phone, right, uh, in the corner next to the signal bar, there'll actually be like a 4G or 3G or an H plus. And that's basically telling you what, your, what uh, mobile communication network generation your phone is sitting on, okay? And so when we say 5G, what we're talking about is the fifth generation of mobile communication networks. And to give you some context, you know, back in the day, we used to have phones on copper wires, right? We talked about before. And then you could only really use voice. Then 2G came around and you had data, right? So, uh, so text messaging, that was the big innovation with 2G. When 3G came around, we could actually send video, right? So phones then started to come with cameras. You could record low resolution video, send it to your friends. And that was a really great thing about uh, that piece. And currently we sit on 4G, which is this really improved 3G, right? So higher, uh, video resolution, more data, et cetera, et cetera. But I think 5G is where the game changes. And let me explain a little bit about why. So if you think about it from a theoretical max speed perspective, 4G right now, a theoretical max speed is about 1,000 megabytes a second. Okay, so, so super quick. But that 5G that comes after it, 10,000 megabytes a second, right? So it's an exponential increase of 10x. But that's a very kind of numerical answer. So let's maybe put it in terms that we might all understand better. So let's think about downloading a two hour high resolution movie, okay? With 3G, it would take you 26 hours. With 4G, it would take you six minutes. But with 5G, at that 10X kind of improvement, it would take you 3.6 seconds, okay? So on Netflix, it would take you longer to decide on what you wanted to watch rather than being able to download that. Okay. And so the applications of that are absolutely, absolutely amazing. And um, I think if we think about it from the context of um, uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, right, as just off the, off the cuff, um, human reaction time is roughly 250 milliseconds, right? So about a quarter of a second. Um, the current kind of a reaction time of a car on, Ford, on a 4G network 
is about 400 milliseconds, right? So it's greater than the human reaction time. So you still want a human being sitting there, right? And the way autonomous vehicles work is they transmit their data somewhere, a decision gets made, and then it comes back, right? So that data transport is part of that 400 millisecond timing, right? If you think about that from the perspective of what is it like in a 5G network, the, the time it takes for a decision to be made in a 5G autonomous vehicle is one millisecond, right? You combine the one millisecond, you compare, sorry, the one millisecond to the 250 millisecond reaction time of a person, and you're basically doing your reactions 250 times better in a 5G autonomous vehicle. So that's the really interesting applications for uh, 5G autonomous vehicles that are coming. And I think 5G in itself will have so many more interesting applications because of its ability to uh, uh, transmit data at speed. So that's personally why I'm really excited about 5G. Uh, and I think that's why we should all kind of you know, look forward to the future uh, with a very optimistic outlook, at least from an AI perspective. So that's really all I had today. More than happy to uh, take uh, questions from you guys. And Mackenzie, I know you also have a slide at the end, so more than happy to put that up if that would be helpful here. Okay, let's go ahead and switch over to questions. So first off, thank you, Kevin, for this great presentation and all the information that you've already shared about AI and whatnot. So kick it off. This may have been the first time that some people have even been introduced to AI. So if someone's interested in learning more about it, where would you recommend them to go? Yeah, so it's a good question, right? Um, I think from an AI perspective, um, one thing I would say is actually getting a sense for what introductory programming is like would actually be a good idea. And the reason why I say that is because you might not become the programmer of the future, but I think what you can get is an appreciation of how folks on the programming side think, right? You know, if you understand kind of the basics of programming, you know, if, if I ask, you know, hey, give me a glass of water, right? I think business folks will just kind of think about it from get the glass of water and go from there. I think when you talk to an engineer, you know, they're thinking, get the glass of water, tilt the jug, you know, 30 degrees, let the glass fill up 70%, stop the tilting. And I think when you understand how they think, your communication actually gets better uh, with them, right? So from working with engineers perspective, I think developing some programming skills are smart. And given the current kind of COVID context where a lot of people are at home, you know, it's a perfect opportunity to just understand the basics of, of coding, right? So if you're thinking about coding and programming languages, for AI, um, uh, uh, Python and R are probably the two you really want to touch. So those are important. Uh, and I think that's one kind of area that's helpful. Um, from a resource perspective, I, I think the challenge with AI is that um, it's a very new field. So there's not that much um, uh, being done on it from like a books perspective. I think where you might see some interesting um, uh, courses, right, are on platforms like Coursera. So Andrew Ung, for example, has a lot of really good uh, resources like Machine Learning 101, some introductory AI classes. I think that would be great to, to sit through because I think that'll give you some appreciation for, um, you know, what AI is, what it can do. Um, and, I, and I think going to, you know, talk, seminars, you know, webinars, I guess, these days about AI will also be good uh, for that as well. And lastly, probably what I'll say is, you know, if you're thinking about developing AI, right, think about use cases and areas you enjoy. Um, I, uh, you know, really enjoy football, right? So I was looking at a lot of AI, and when I say football, I mean soccer, because that's what the rest of the world calls it. Um, and so uh, typically, you know, I was looking at AI applications in sports, right? So machine vision, uh, machine learning. Um, I think if you just read about it theoretically, it's very dry. But I think if you look at it in context with the, with, in, within which you enjoy, um, I think it's a lot easier to appreciate what it can really do. So that would be kind of my other piece on that too. Awesome, thanks Kevin. So Liz, you have your hand raised. You wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, um, I'll caveat that it's not really a question, but hi Kevin, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I think it's been wonderful. I know absolutely nothing about AI, but I this was like a great introduction. Um, I'm actually an, uh, an alum of Alpha Kappa Psi and I work for an organization or an association that serves change management professionals. So that's our entire, uh, our mission is to, is to uh, uh, help create our, or pave the way that uh, change happens. And so one of our like conference sessions was about digital transformation. So this just really spoke to me and it was good insight, um, you know, to understand how our members are thinking and some of the things that they're working through. So 
like I said, don't have a question, but I, I really appreciate your time today. This was awesome. No problem, Liz. And and honestly, Liz, if you know, if it would be helpful for you know the members of that organization of your, that organization for for me to do something similar for you guys, you know, more than happy to to do that. I mean, I, I think part of our goal here at, at Blue is to really kind of uh, increase awareness about AI, and I think things like this, um, you know, certainly do that. Um, I think it's important, also, like I was saying before, right? You want to demystify AI a little bit, and I think you also want to make people feel more comfortable with it. So I think if this served as a good introduction, then I've kind of done my job there. So that makes me feel good about it. Uh, and if we can, you know, at any point work together in the future to do something like this, I'm more than happy to help on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, another question for you, Kevin. So you've just touched on a little bit that AI is not just for the programmers and the mathematicians, but so what would you say to this, those people that aren't interested in that on why they should be interested in AI? So, so folks on the business side, you mean, right? Yeah, or just any kind of creative, non-STEM focus. Non-technical, non okay, yeah. Um, look, I think one of the big things that's happening, right, the applications of AI, and I didn't talk about machine learning or any of the individual technologies. I mean, if we have a longer time, I would have gone into those a bit. But once you start seeing those technologies, you begin to see that the applications go across sectors, across industries, across, you know, um, uh, literally everything. Right? I mean, AI is going to have its, its hands and everything. And I think often we tend to underestimate short-term change and, sorry, uh, other way around. We tend to overestimate short-term change and underestimate long-term change. So I think in the kind of longer future, uh, we're definitely going to see AI have its hands in everything. So even if you're a creative, right, even if you're in kind of a non-technical field, you're going to see stuff happening. Like we talked about the painting, right? I mean, I think many people would say that art is really, really far away from AI. Um, but no, I mean, we're seeing, you know, AI creating art, right? Um, we, I actually used to have my office in a co-working space that had a lot of very artsy uh, companies. And I gave a talk about um, AI's, um, you know, uh, uh, use in art. And I have no more friends there anymore because all of them were like, hey, you know, this is completely wrong. AI should not be part of the art world. Uh, this is blasphemy, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, you know, I think it's about being open. Right? And, and I think it's important to be open because uh, AI is really going to have its fingers in, in absolutely everything going forward. Uh, so irrespective of which industry you're in, irrespective of what sector, sector or specialty, I think AI is going to get there. Right? So you may not understand the programming part of it, and that's totally fine, but you need to understand what it can do. Right? And you need to understand how it can help you do your job, your function, how it can help your company do better. I think because of that, that's really why people need to pay attention to it. Because it's coming. Whether you want to embrace it or not, uh, it's definitely coming. So, so I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. Very good points. So we are just about that time. So Kevin, do you have any final thoughts you want to share about AI? Uh, yeah, I, I think you know, the most important thing I would say, especially to a more student audience, um, you know, AI is going to lead to a lot of changes. I think in the future, we're probably going to have jobs that we haven't even conceptualized today, right? In, back in 2008, right, the first smartphone comes out. If you told kids in 2008, five years down the line, you're going to be an app developer, they would have had no idea what you're talking about, right? But today, a bunch of folks in Thailand, India, especially in Asia, many people develop apps. So I think likewise, AI is going to give rise to a lot of new careers down the line. Um, I was actually at my high school uh, about a month ago. And I was talking to the philosophy students, and they were actually saying that, you know, we think ethicists are going to become really important because when you have AI, the real question is like how to use it, right? It's not really about decision execution. You know, if we talk about the, the example I gave on the cars, right? It's not really going to be about hit the brakes. It's going to be do you hit the two little kids or do you hit the old lady, right? And I think that's where the ethicists are going to become very important because they have to guide the AI. We still have to provide what should the AI do. The AI is more about execution. So I guess my point is that jobs that we don't currently know uh, that are there are going to come. And I think, therefore, concentrating on continuous learning, you know, con con uh, concentrating on skill development, even after you're done with college, is going to become even more important. Right? So I, I just think keep the culture of learning open. Uh, I know the context and the situation right now is really difficult. Use that as a time to build these skills. Right? because I think that's going to help you down the line as well. So those are probably my, my kind of two main points. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin, for all of your information and all the knowledge that you shared with us. 
want to go ahead and flip to that last slide, just quick reminders to everybody to log into the My AKSI community. You'll be able to engage with other members in the collaboration groups and register for more upcoming topics like this on the events tab. So one last time, thank you, Kevin, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for joining as well. And we will see you in the My AKSI community. All right, thank you guys. And feel free to connect over LinkedIn or anything like that. Always more than happy to share my views. And I tend to also post articles from time to time about AI too. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Okay, thanks everyone.